أنا وزملائي الدكتور خالد المتصر والدكتورة وفاء مدنات أن نفتتح الجلسة السادسة من هذا المؤتمر وقبل البدء بالجلسات سيقدم الدكتور باسل المصري رئيس جمعية أمراض المفاصل الأردنية شهادات تقدير لرؤساء جمعيتنا السابقين ومؤسسي الرابطة العربية لأمراض المفاصل تفضل. السلام عليكم يعطيكم العافية طبعا ما في جمعية أو أي نشاط أو أي مجموعة بتشتغل إلا لازم تأخذ الماضي لولا الماضي الناجح ما بيكون المستقبل الحاضر والمستقبل فإحنا بنعترف بزملائنا اللي أسسوا الجمعية واللي كان لهم دور ريادي فرؤساء السابقين للجمعية أطباء المفاصل الأردنية ورمتزة المفاصل الأردنية ونطلب أول شيء من الدكتور بديع الصالح المؤسس والرئيس الأول للجمعية والدكتور بديع بدي أحكي شغلة بصراحة أنا بحب أستغيبه حتى بكل المؤتمرات بكون أول واحد وبطلع أول آخر واحد هذه استغابة دكتور بديع عشان هذه التقدير ونشكرك شكرا الرئيس اللي يجب على الدكتور بديع حبيبنا أخونا الدكتور موسى الحديدي اللي طبعا إله فضل طبعا بمؤتمر الرابطة العربية أظن بالبيكنبنسكي مع الدكتور وفاء كانوا مشاركين والكل شارك أظن أن ساعتكم شوي صغيرة دكتور موسى ألف مبروك أعطينا دكتور موسى شكراً دكتور موسى بعد دكتور موسى في عندنا دكتور زميلنا وحبيبنا دكتور مرزوق خير أين الدكتور مرزوق اللي دار مؤتمر رابطة الأبلار في البحر الميت دور مميز وهو من أقدم أخصائيين الروماتيزم في البلد ولسا أكثر واحد شباب فيهم الدكتور علاء الهرش حبيبنا وأخونا الإنسان الهادئ والمبتسم دائما <تصفيق> طبعا اخيرا زميلنا الدكتور خضر هو غائب لكن دكتور جمال السيتيه حياخذ الشهاده عنه واحنا بنخبره ان شاء الله دكتور خضر كمان من الناشطين في الجمعيه واللي عمل مؤتمرات سابقه دكتور جمال النيابه عن دكتور خضر دكتور خضر طبعا عندنا اسم خضر شكرا دكتور جمال قبل ان اختم احنا كان عندنا اجتماع هلا لمجلس إدارة الرابطة العربية اللي هلا صار اسمها الرابطة العربية لجمعيات الروماتيزم بعد ما صارت تعديلات عليها وبرضه احنا لا ننسى التاريخ تم تأسيس الرابطة ب 1995 في القاهرة من مجموعة أنا كنت بالصدفة موجود كح... ك... يعني ك... عضو كمح... ك... يعني مشارك بالجلسات وكان الأردن يمثلها الدكتور زهير الصباخ والدكتور أيمن القرف الجرف أو القرف كانوا موجودين وكانوا من مؤسسين الرابطة العربية في 95 فإحنا بندعو الدكتور أيمن القرف نشكره على إنه من الناس اللي أسسوا لهم دور مهم جدا في تاريخ الرابطة العربية اللي إحنا هلا عم نستمر فيها ونشكره كتير تفضل دكتور أيمن أخيراً حبيبنا وأخونا الدكتور زهير الصباغ اللي هو له دور أساسي في تأسيس الرابطة العربية للأمراض الروماتيزم الدكتور الإنسان الرقيق والهادئ والمبتسم دائماً لما يأصب لما يأصب ما تخاف من هذه لما يأصب شكرا لكم جميعا على صبركم وهلا نبدا الجلسه وتفضلوا. ثانك يو دكتور باسل. جود ايفنينج. اتس 
my pleasure and honor to introduce again Professor Nadira Suez, who is well known to you now. She's a professor of uh, rheumatology at the uh, Chicago Medical School and a uh, well-known world figure in uh, sarcoidosis um, uh, research. Her topic will be on uh, sarcoidosis update, past, present, and future directions. Please. Thank you for your kind introduction. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm delighted to be uh, here today to talk about uh, sarcoidosis, give you an update about sarcoidosis, past, uh, present, and uh, future uh, directions. Uh, I founded and I'm directing the uh, Bernie Mac uh, Star Center, the Sarcoidosis Translational Advanced Research Center at the University of Illinois. Bernie Mac is a comedian uh, who died from uh, infections related to medications given to treat his sarcoidosis. Um, so uh, this center serves a lot of patients um, in Chicago and surrounding areas, especially with a focus on underserved and African-American patients. This is my disclosure statement. I have uh, received uh, research funding uh, from uh, various uh, sources, including the National Institute of Health to study sarcoidosis. I will be discussing off-label medications not approved by the FDA for the treatment of sarcoidosis. We have to keep in mind that there is no drug that's approved by the FDA to treat sarcoidosis, although there is a debate that prednisone perhaps is approved by the FDA uh, to treat sarcoidosis, but we do not have real drugs that are approved. Um, and uh, I will present some patients' photos who agreed to share their photos. This is the outline of my uh, talk. Uh, we will discuss the uh, clinical uh, phenotypes um, of uh, uh, sarcoidosis. Uh, we will discuss the clinical presentation of refractory disease, and we will discuss the treatment options for refractory sarcoidosis, uh, past, present, um, and future. Uh, this is Jonathan uh, Hutchinson. Uh, Jonathan Hutchinson was the first to describe what looks like a soriform plaques in uh, the skin of a patient. Uh, in 1869, which serves as probably the first case of sarcoid of the skin described, although there are other stories that um, mention that Beth Hoven probably was the first case of sarcoidosis where he lost his hearing uh, from uh, sarcoidosis. Uh, and uh, Hansen first publishes his account on a patient under the title, Case of Levit Papillary uh, Psoriasis. Uh, until uh, Caesar Boeck came, uh, the name uh, Boeck disease did not exist. Uh, so sometimes sarcoidosis is referred to as Boeck disease, where Boeck described another uh, presentation of the disease and published that in 1899. What is the definition of clinical phenotype, and why do we focus on clinical phenotype? From some of the elegant talks presented yesterday, we, we saw that even within rheumatoid arthritis, we have more than one phenotype. So in various diseases that we treat, lupus, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, and closing spondylitis, you will find patients different. They don't present the same presentation, hence the name clinical phenotype. Um, so when we talk about clinical phenotype, uh, we try to uh, understand that at the bedside because understanding the clinical phenotype will allow you uh, to provide the right treatment for that phenotype. Definition of a true phenotype requires a unifying and consistent natural history, consistent clinical and physiologic characteristics, and underlying pathophysiology with identifiable biomarkers and genetics. In the field of sarcoidosis, there are no large-scale data available about the incidence, natural history, risk factors, and pattern of phenotypes of sarcoidosis over time. What's the prevalence of sarcoidosis uh, by region and ethnicity? Um, its proportions probably per 100,000 population ranged uh, from 0 0.1 um, to um, 64, uh, now those numbers need to be looked at with uh, 
uh, caution uh, because those are different design studies. Suffice it to say that uh, sarcoidosis is uh, very common in African American uh, and uh, tends to be more severe. When I tried to search the literature to see what's the prevalence of sarcoidosis in the Middle East or in Jordan, I didn't find many citations, probably some papers talking about dermatologic manifestations of sarcoidosis. So I don't know how common sarcoidosis in Jordan. Certainly when I was working at the University of Jordan, I used to see a lot of uh, uh, cases with uh, Professor Naif Abdullah, or Professor Nabil Samara, but I, I don't know if there are papers discussing the prevalence of this disease uh, in Jordan and other areas of the Middle East, certainly an area to be looked at. Um, in the United States, um, this is uh, a, a, a slide courtesy of uh, my uh, colleague and collaborator Robert Poffman at the University of Cincinnati. And this is from the ACCESS uh, study, uh, which is an, uh, a case control study looking at the etiology of sarcoidosis. While this study did not tell us what the uh, cause of sarcoidosis is, but it showed us um, many, um, it, it taught us many things about sarcoidosis. The disease is, is common in uh, African American uh, patients. I'm trying to find the laser pointer here. So in African-American uh, patients, uh, especially females, more than males, uh, and if you look at uh, the disease, the, um, the green columns uh, represent uh, females um, and the yellow represent males. In, in various ethnicities, uh, the disease tend to be more common in females. It's a disease that affects young people um, at the peak of their uh, productivity. And if you look within the United States, uh, it's more prevalent in the Northeast. And if you look at the various manifestations in terms of organ involvement, the disease tend uh, to uh, affect uh, African-American patients more commonly in regards to every organ involvement with the exception of hypercalcemia and hypercalciuria, with, which tends to be more common in non-African-American patients. Let's look at the racial differences in sarcoidosis. Yesterday I presented a study about lupus mortality in the United States. This is a study that um, we published in the CHESS 2014, um, conducted by myself and my colleagues, first author, one of my former fellows, where we looked at sarcoidosis mortality in the United States um, over time, and where uh, we uh, looked uh, data from uh, immediate causes of death in almost 10,000 uh, patients. What was interesting in our study is that the age-adjusted mortality rate for African American was 12 times higher than Caucasian, and although the total sarcoidosis age-adjusted mortality has not changed in the last 12 years, the rate was increasing in Caucasian, something you do not see in lupus. In lupus, you still see it increasing in African American patients. But what we found in this study as well, that we are neglecting pulmonary hypertension and we're not screening enough for pulmonary hypertension. I think the same applies to systemic sclerosis and a subset of patients with lupus where screening of pulmonary hypertension is important. Let me go ahead and start with a case study, a case from my clinic. This is a 38-year-old African-American patient with history of bipolar disorder and psychosis. He presented with um, significant joint pain uh, but you see those aggressive, uh, destructive nasal lesions. Uh, while this patient had um, former biopsy from a skin lesion on the arm that showed uh, non-specific granulomas, you would like to see the really well-formed non-chesiating granulomas uh, before you make the diagnosis of sarcoidosis. Um, so we ended up uh, doing a biopsy from the nose that confirmed the presence of non-chesiating granulomas. Need to keep in mind that show, seeing the granulomas is not enough. Staining for acid fast bacilli, excluding fungal infections, and in select cases, if you are suspicious about tuberculosis, um, where sometimes you may see some caseation, you have to send a tissue culture. AFP is not enough, so uh, you may uh, save an extra piece of the tissue and send it for culture, to culture the tissue for certain uh, infections if you're suspicious about, especially mycobacterial infections, fungal infections. Another thing to keep in mind when you see non caseating granulomas or granulomatous reactions in general um, is to look for lymphomas. Lymphomas sometimes may present with granulomatous reactions. So in this particular patient, his uh, CD4 count 
was uh, low. And why did we check the CD4 count? Because his, uh, he had peripheral lymphopenia, and HIV is common in the United States. However, he was HIV uh, negative. So this patient received the standard treatment where he received um, uh, corticosteroids. However, with even four milligrams of methylprednisone, he developed severe psychosis. So uh, psychosis, although described in higher doses of corticosteroids, it can happen at small doses of corticosteroids. Um, and it's reversible once you stop corticosteroids. So he was switched to methotrexate, he developed hepatotoxicity, he was switched to isothioprine, he developed pancreatitis, he was started in hydroxychloroquine, um, he could not tolerate it and developed actually a prolonged uh, QT interval from hydroxychloroquine, a drug that you hardly ever see any cardiac toxicity. So the question was, he referred to me for additional treatment. So uh, the next step was, um, let's stage the disease. Um, now, if the chest X-ray is normal, you should not be ordering a chest CT scan. However, in this particular case, um, we, uh, because the patient had history of palpitations, and because we were concerned about the cardiac issues, although we were not sure if it was plaquenil toxicity or cardiac sarcoid, we ended up doing a cardiac MRI for further evaluation of cardiac sarcoid. If you look at the literature in the last two years, you'll see a very large number of papers on cardiac imaging and cardiac sarcoidosis using cardiac MRI and PET scan more than anything that was published probably over the last uh, 10 years. So when we did a cardiac MRI, the um, uh, cardiac MRI showed, um, was, was within normal limits. It did not show any abnormality uh, of the heart. Um, so since our data suggested PET scan may be more sensitive, we ended up doing um, a PET scan uh, for this patient. Now with the PET scan, I would like to mention that the way we did um, the PET scan was using a three-day, uh, what we call sarcoid diet, and I'll explain this further and explain why. Now if you look at the patient chest x-ray, uh, the staging, the old staging, um, normal is zero, bilateral hyaluridinopathy is one, hyaluridinopathy parenchymal infiltrate is two, and three is parenchymal infiltrate without hyaluridinopathy, and stage four, signs of lung fibrosis. So by his chest x-ray, he's probably stage zero because the chest x-ray was normal. Now when we did the PET scan, um, do you know how to use the uh, mouse here, um, the pointer? because I want to point to a few things here. Oh, thank you. So here I would like to show you this area, uh, which looks like a circle enhancement. Now initially we thought, wow, well, this could be enhancement and that's cardiac sarcoidosis increase uptake. But this patient did not have a proper preparation. So this is not cardiac sarcoidosis. This is a false image. So this is a normal finding in terms of the heart. Now, if you see, I listed uh, the reference here, uh, which was the paper uh, uh, that we published 2017. And that was highlighted on many uh, other journals, cited, and actually received a lot of um, uh, press. Uh, because it's the, f the largest study in the literature to look at the largest number of sarcoidosis patients imaged by PET scan using a diet that we proposed called the sarcoid diet, where we put patients on three-day, very high-fat, no-sugar diet to improve the sensitivity of detecting cardiac sarcoidosis, okay? This diet has not been validated, uh, but most centers in the world now follow our approach, but we hope for validation of this study before be this becomes the standard of care before you image patients with sarcoidosis. When you image patients with cancer, sometimes after midnight or one day preparation, but with sarcoid it's different because if the patient eats sugar, you, the heart may light up and you may be concerned that the heart is full of cardiac sarcoid. With proper preparation, you avoid this. Although the heart did not show sarcoid, but what you see here, we saw sarcoid in the pelvic bones, and we saw the hilar lymph nodes, okay? Patient was asymptomatic in terms of the bone. He had bone sarcoid, but that was not the reason why we wanted to treat him. So, so the question is, what clinical phenotype this patient has? If we look at the clinical uh, phenotype studies that published about sarcoidosis, um, I 
reviewed all the literature from 1960 until 2018. And you'll find some papers look at the diseases, severe versus non-severe, acute versus chronic, uh, acute versus relapsing, severe versus non-severe. None of these studies were validated. They were mostly one center or two centers. And uh, it is hard to unify this disease under one phenotype based on those published studies. So I thought, let me take a different approach. Let me apply what I've learned from rheumatology to this field to see if we can make a difference in, in highlighting the, types, uh, the phenotypes. Uh, so I was involved in the study called the GRAD study. Few papers came out of this GRAD study, which was uh, a large uh, NIH published study at multiple centers in the United States trying to um, define um, sarcoidosis uh, pathophysiology as well as alpha-1 antitrypsin. And I can tell you, after two years of planning this, we had multiple fights as what phenotypes are we going to use. The paper that we published included different groups, uh, group one through group uh, nine, and you can see some of them say cardiac defining, others stage four, and that's among pulmonologists, myself as a rheumatologist and other scientists. Uh, so we're still struggling with how to classify the phenotypes. So I thought maybe I should look at this in a different way, a translational way. Uh, I'm not going to go over all these papers I published in details, but I'll highlight a few things. Uh, in 2010, uh, we noted that lymphopenia is common in patients with sarcoidosis. And patients with sarcoidosis may present with a CD4 count less than 100 that may be similar to HIV patients, but those patients do not have increased risk of infection. So we reported for the first time that lymphopenia is a marker of sarcoidosis activity, um, and it, um, it can be either CD4, CD8, or CD19 lymphopenia. We went uh, further uh, to uh, do a post hoc analysis on the largest randomized controlled trial in the field of sarcoid using infleximab in the treatment of pulmonary sarcoidosis. And infleximab is a chimeric monoclonal antibody against TNF. In that post hoc analysis, this was the first study that showed that C-reactive protein is increased in patients with pulmonary sarcoidosis and may predict a better response to uh, anti-TNF uh, therapy. Uh, furthermore, we went in to look into anti uh, interferon alpha, and we found the signature of interferon alpha in patients with sarcoidosis um, that did not exist before. And you saw from the talks yesterday, there's already an antibody against anti interferon alpha that's been used in lupus. Um, so we hope this will be one of the drugs we use in sarcoidosis in the future. There were many other studies, including uh, things that we looked at fibrotic markers, even we isolated peripheral blood mononuclear cells and we identified a gene signature in some of these papers where we were able to define um, severe disease, whether it's cardiac or neuro. But the bottom line, after I published all these papers, how is that helping me clinically at bedside? When you talk to the patient, patient doesn't care which pathway is upregulated or downregulated. Uh, you, you want to decide at bedside what's the best treatment. Uh, and basic science, if it doesn't serve patients, it, it, then it doesn't satisfy the purpose of research. So if you, so we're still not getting anywhere with the clinical phenotype in the last three years. In the next three years, I think we're going to publish more data with better classifications of the phenotypes. Um, the one perfect phenotype of sarcoidosis uh, is Lofgren syndrome. Age less than 40, bilateral hyalur adenopathy, erythema nodosum. Erythema nodosum, it's the only lesion you do not need to biopsy. Why? Because you may not see granulomas if you biopsy it. It remains a clinical diagnosis. Exclude all other causes of erythema nodosum. You'll have symmetric ankle arthritis, and that's associated with HLA DRB10301. And if you use these criteria, there is high sensitivity and specificity, and patients uh, recover whether you treat them or not. If they need something, low-dose corticosteroid less than 20 milligrams a day will be helpful. When we talk about refractory disease, how do we define refractory disease? Again, I'm presenting the rheumatology perspective of this disease because this is a disease that has been owned by pulmonologists for years, or patients either go to the ophthalmologist or to the hepatologist, and they, we don't evaluate patients from head to toe 
and it's a systemic disease. So pulmonologists view this disease as a pulmonary disease with extra pulmonary manifestations. For us rheumatologists, we're changing this paradigm and we believe this is a systemic disease with pulmonary manifestations. Um, and it's challenging to define refractory sarcoidosis but we have to start somewhere. There is no definition in the literature. So I was fortunate to be able to introduce that definition to the literature. So that definition is published, again, based on what, how we do define refractory rheumatoids. So what we propose as a definition that was published is any progressive disease, despite adequate doses of corticosteroids and corticosteroid sparing therapy uh, due to lack of efficacy, toxicity, um, or intolerability. Uh, I have to admit, a lot of pulmonologists did not like this definition. It's a rheumatologic definition, but I thought you have to start somewhere uh, and then modify these definitions for the sakes of research. What are the clinical presentations of sarcoidosis? Um, pulmonary in 80%, 90% of the cases. And when pulmonary involvement occur as the isolated involvement within the first two to three years, 70% of the patients may go into spontaneous remission, whether you treat them or not. The ones we worry about are the ones who progress after two years uh, and go into chronic disease. Extrapulmonary disease can affect the brain, um, the heart, the liver, uh, the muscles. Um, uh, we did publish before about uh, sarcoid myositis. Uh, small fiber neuropathy is a big thing right now in sarcoid. And I would mention a few words about vitamin D in sarcoidosis. Now, the practice of vitamin D replacement varies in different parts of the world. And I believe uh, everybody probably here in the room either prescribes vitamin D or takes vitamin D for the health benefits of vitamin D. And uh, the standards that are um, well agreed upon is that your vitamin D should be close to 30 or maybe needs to be 70 and we're talking about 25 hydroxy vitamin D. Definitely there is data to support the replacement of vitamin D in lupus, vitamin D in men with prostate cancer, vitamin D in breast cancer. Uh, but uh, I started doing a study years ago, which I didn't finish uh, in Jordan, about vitamin D, especially in women wearing hijab without exposure to the sun, and what is the optimal vitamin D level. If you look at recent papers from The Lancet, there's a still a big debate. What is the optimal blood level of vitamin D? How much should you take every day? Should you give everybody 50,000 units? Should you use IV vitamin D? We don't use parenteral uh, vitamin D in the United States, but I believe it's used in Jordan. The reason I mention this, for all other diseases, you do not worry about replacing vitamin D, even if it's high dose. But for sarcoidosis, uh, the marker for vitamin D evaluation is not vitamin D25, but vitamin D125. Why? Because vitamin D125 is produced by the granulomas. And when you provide vitamin D, you may stimulate the granulomas and actually induce hypercalcemia and induce a flare of the disease. Uh, one of my patients got 50,000 units of vitamin D, was exposed to the sun, and ended up with ventricular tachycardia in the uh, CCU where her vitamin D125 was above 100, um, although her calcium level was normal. So most of the papers right now recommend being careful with replacing vitamin D. If you want to replace vitamin D in sarcoid, please check vitamin D125 until we have more data. If, if I can pass this message today, I think that is more important than all the other advances in sarcoid. Um, let's go over some clinical presentations. Um, this is um, a lady who came to see me with sarcoid of the nose and sarcoid on the lip. Now, she had bilateral hilar adenopathy, no shortness of breath, so there is no need to treat the lung. Okay, EKG normal, um, she, didn't, she had palpitations, that's why we checked EKG. But her daughter's wedding was in four weeks, she requested the treatment. Now, there is no consensus of how much steroids you give and which type of prednisone you give. My approach, I start low and go high rather than go high like lupus and go down. So I give her only actually four milligrams of methylprednisone and this is the response in two weeks, okay? This is a case who had tiny uh, sarcoid nodules on her tattoo. Um, and she took the flu vaccine. We noted in the same arm, she took the flu vaccine within 24 hours, I was able to induce sarcoid in human with sarcoid lesions in the tattoo, suggesting a possible interferon alpha mechanism. 
and that responded to low-dose corticosteroids. So those are some of my patients over the years, I would say over the past 17 years. Uh, some of them, like this lady presented with perforation of the palate from sarcoid, okay? Now you have to exclude midline granuloma and other cancers, but in this case, her presentation was whenever she eats, uh, she will, uh, the food will come through the nose. Um, so uh, she ended up failing multiple therapies, but ended up dying of fungal infection. This is a lady who presented with this brain lesion uh, with temporal lobe seizures. And actually, she became hyper-religious. Uh, that was her presentation. Uh, and um, I have other neurosarcoid cases where a lot of emotional instability, they may present with bipolar disorder, uh, or I have a patient who started forgetting his wife and thinking he's not married. So uh, that, keep in mind, uh, if you have a man with sarcoidosis presenting with sexual dysfunction, make sure to do proper imaging, endocrine workup, including pituitary workup. Same applies to women with some psychiatric disorders and uh, hyperprolactinemia or seizures. Um, and we need a different session for neurosarcoid, but this patient refused to take corticosteroids or corticosteroid sparing agents. So it was one of the first cases I treated actually with adalimumab as a monotherapy uh, that proved to me that adalimumab crosses the blood-brain barrier. She had complete resolution of the lesion, but after she got better, she wanted to sue the ENT doctor who biopsied her nose and saw some granulomas. She said, if that doctor treated me, neurosarcoid would not have developed. Um, and uh, I was actually asked to testify in the court for this case. Um, this is a patient who presented with severe uh, joint involvement. Now, this is a patient who presented with like, what I call anosia. She came to us very advanced. Um, but the, what we did actually, this is the, f the only case I combined uh, thalidomide with infleximab, with mycophenolate, with hydroxychloroquine. And after we controlled the lesions, the plastic surgeon did a nose transplant she did fantastic, but their question to me was, how can you guarantee at the site where we transplanted the nose, sarcoid will not grow? And you know, there's certain things you cannot answer. She lost the follow-up because she lost her insurance. This is a patient where infleximab was discontinued without being tapered. In rheumatoid, you stop uh, infleximab, nothing happens, the patient will have a flare of their joint. But in sarcoid, if you stop those biologics without taper, you get destructive lesions, okay? This is a case who had sarcoid and discoid in the same lesion. Uh, I don't need to teach uh, this uh, crowd about how to diagnose uh, sarcoid. You all know about the algorithm uh, better than me. Let's uh, move on to some clinical trials. Um, this is a, a reference that you can uh, reach out to called the WASAC Sarcoidosis Organ Assessment. Uh, our colleagues and myself uh, in the sarcoid um, group, uh, we came up with this instrument to help physicians diagnose various phenotypes of sarcoid. So we divided it into highly probable, probable, possible, or no consensus. Um, again, um, I think one of the groups were uh, from England. I do hope in our future studies to have a representation from uh, the Middle East and Jordan. So when would you treat sarcoidosis? Uh, when should you treat it? Uh, when there is evidence of end organ damage and or danger of damage, regardless where this organ is, since this is a multi-system disease, if the danger is in the brain, you treat the brain. If the danger is in the lung, treat the lung. Or when the quality of life suffers by the granulomatous uh, and non-granulomatous effect of sarcoidosis. Initial treatment is corticosteroids. You don't have to go with high dosages. 15 milligram is enough initially. Uh, unless you're dealing with neurosarcoidosis, even with neurosarcoidosis, sometimes 60 milligram may be enough. And if you have to pulse somebody, many pulses okay, whether it's 500 or 100. Rarely ever I have to give higher dosages. Maybe when I encounter resistant ventricular tachycardia storm in the ICU, I may give 100 or 200 with a careful watch of the electrolytes um, of solimidrol combining that with amiodarone. For exacerbations, you may give uh, 20 uh, milligrams. For chronic treatment, probably less than 20. Um, what other agents you may use? Um, you can use methotrexate, loflonamide, isothioprine, mycophenolate, cyclosporin. You may use the cytokine modulators or biologics, or you may use the anti-malarials, minocycline, or the combination antibiotic regimen that's still in clinical trials. 
What is the data behind all those small trials, not well-designed trials? We cannot make major conclusions and say methotrexate is the drug of choice or infleximab is the drug of choice. So um, let me skip this one. In terms of corticosteroids sparing agents, we name them right now as disease-modifying anti-sarcoid drugs uh, for uh, similar to disease-modifying anti-rheumatoid drugs. And if the relapse rate with corticosteroids 73%, we see relapse rate with methotrexate up to 88%, and with infleximab, maybe 86 to 62%. Um, there is 15% histologic evidence of liver toxicity with methotrexate. If your patient has fatty liver, there is recent data to suggest that using methotrexate may be detrimental with fatty liver. Is a fibrin similar to methotrexate in the treatment, but more risk of infections? This is the largest multi-center randomized control trial in the field of sarcoid using infleximab. When we designed this study, FVC was the primary endpoint at uh, 24 weeks. Unfortunately, uh, the study, while slightly positive, the FDA was not convinced this is good enough, so the drug was not approved by the FDA. And the primary endpoint was the lung, but we found that this works best for the brain, the eye, and the skin. And uh, here is uh, an improvement after use of infleximab. You see the improvement in the joint occurred after few years while in the skin after two weeks. Uh, we went ahead and we did a study on a stekinumab or galimumab in patients with chronic sarcoidosis. It didn't work. Again, the outcome was FVC. Then I designed a study using adalimumab, a pilot open-label study that showed similar benefits in the FVC and quality of life as infleximab, but the drug is not FDA approved. Um, so uh, here I just want to highlight that when you treat the joint and sarcoid between this picture and this picture, literally five years. So it takes time for the joints to improve while the skin gets better quicker. This is a young man with cardiac sarcoid with ventricular tachycardia who filled corticosteroids and methotrexate. This is how his, his PET scan um, appeared. And we added a delimumab, and this is four years after therapy, complete resolution, no ventricular tachycardia, but such treatment is off-label and long-term safety is unknown. This is a patient who had ventricular tachycardia, got cardiac arrest, was resuscitated. We did a cardiac biopsy, and when we stained the heart, uh, we did some CD20 staining, and we found some B cells there, although mostly CD68 cells. So we asked the question, where are the B cells? Can we target B cells in sarcoid? Um, so such that we designed this study, rituximab, in the treatment of refractory pulmonary sarcoid. So I treated only, this is a pilot study, that only few patients were treated. We found a signal of improvement in TNF failures. All this preliminary, the minute that was published, there were a lot of cases or responses in Twitter saying, Swice is saying, rituximab in sarcoid, everybody should use rituximab. We have to be careful about these studies. If it's a pilot study, not randomized control trial, it may mean nothing when you go to a randomized control trial, but it's worth investigating. And most recently, we looked at uh, Octar gel, or repository corticotropin for chronic pulmonary sarcoid, and we found improvement in the pulmonary function. However, we saw some toxicity in terms of hyperglycemia, increased skin pigmentation, and psychiatric effects. This is Back to my patient before we close. Um, we treated him with infleximab, then we added um, Octar gel, and this is, you see, after treatment. However, again, the long-term safety of such regimen is unknown. Although he got better, he's still miserable from small fiber neuropathy. So you treat one phenotype, the other phenotype does not get better. We established what's called the America's Association of Sarcoidosis. I was honored to create this logo. With the help of my sister, we chose St. George picture from Jordan. Uh, St. George is a saint that uh, I think everybody respects, regardless of the religion. So he's killing the dragon here. And this is the WASOC, the World Association of Sarcoid, and this is their logo. And St. George was chosen because he's the patron saint of England. So you see the dragon with multiple heads, and that represents sarcoidosis with uh, multiple heads. Uh, so... In terms of future directions, currently we are studying omics 
in precision medicine. We got funding from the National Institute of Health to study the microbiome and the genetics of sarcoidosis and the host immune responses. We're looking into healthcare delivery, how best to image cardiac sarcoid, a prospective study in cardiac sarcoid, and we're trying to see the role of macrophages and T-cell interactions in patients with sarcoidosis. And my dream is to design, actually, a multicenter methotrexate clinical trial in sarcoid. In conclusion, the principle of personalized sarcoidosis medicine is to bring the right drug to the right patient with the right phenotype at the right dose, such that therapeutic efficacy is maximized and the side effects are kept to minimum. Sarcoidosis is a heterogeneous disease. It's not a one disease. Thus, we suggest the name sarcoidosis. Corticosteroids remain the first uh, treatment option. Optimal dose and duration is unknown. Thus, you need the personalized approach and a multidisciplinary team approach to use disease-modifying anti-sarcoid drugs and biologic therapy, and keep an eye on safety as well. The lessons learned from systemic autoimmune diseases will allow us to create a paradigm shift in the approach of uh, sarcoidosis where we believe it's a systemic disease with, ex with pulmonary manifestations. Uh, I acknowledge Jordanian Society of Rheumatology, all of the audience uh, for bearing with this long presentation, um, funding resources, mentors and mentees, and I mean by mentees um, and mentors from University of Jordan from my, when I was a student, without those great teachers, I wouldn't be standing here today. This is a picture I took on my way when I came to Jordan two days ago, and the moon looks beautiful in Jordan, and while uh, I don't live in the heart of Jordan, lives, Jordan lives in my heart wherever I go. Uh, this moon is better than any other moon, and this is a quote uh, that I wrote. Uh, I do some writing on the side. Uh, physicians should speak words of love and passion to heal the broken hearts. But if the physicians already have broken hearts, you should start by fixing your broken hearts and look at the positive side. That's why I put the picture, despite the darkness around us, try to look at the bright side. And I will conclude with my favorite uh, doctor of all doctors, Ibn Sina. Al-wahmu nusfu wal-itma'inanu nusfu dawa والصبر بداية الشفاء استودعكم خيرا شكرا Thank you Professor Nadira for this excellent talk The floor now is open for discussion Any questions? Yes please Professor هون Professor الغرف أيمن Thank you for this uh, elegant presentation May I ask about the paradoxical effect of TNF inhibitors? I mean, I saw one or two cases, uh, TNF induced sarcoidosis. Correct. And very recently, I saw a doctor with psoriatic arthritis treated with sicokinumab, and she developed sarcoidosis. Okay, so that's a great question. The paradoxical effect of anti-TNF inhibitors causing sarcoidosis and then a patient who's taking sikikinumab who developed sarcoidosis. First time I published about this was 2007 on an article called um, TNF inhibition in the treatment of sarcoidosis is slaying the dragon, meaning uh, St. George dragon. And in that uh, editorial, we talked about uh, how interferon alpha mechanism may be the reason why we may get this paradoxical reaction. If you look at the literature, there's a large uh, study from England talking about autoimmunity induced by anti-TNF therapy. So what I always teach my students, you give anti-TNF for psoriasis, psoriasis get worse. Before you say this is not working, think about this paradoxical reaction. So this paradoxical reaction does not happen only with sarcoid, happens in psoriasis, sarcoid, rheumatoid arthritis, Crohn's disease, and you'll see a variety of skin lesions induced by sarcoidosis. What causes this, we don't know. We see it more with etanercept, more so than infleximab or adalimumab, but it's seen in all classes, so it's not a class effect. How do we treat it? We stop the anti-TNF, we taper it, small corticosteroid dosages plus methotrexate will take care of it. If I want to switch them and there is a real reason, rituximab is my next uh, option or tocilizumab. In terms of sikikinumab, a new drug, and that is, I think, uh, the same uh, mechanism, probably interferon-mediated, but 
still we need to learn about it. Okay, we have one another more question. question. Um, yeah, thank you, Dr. Nadira. My question is, how do you feel about methotrexate use in the patients with advanced pulmonary sarcoidosis in the setting where you think the infleximab is not appropriate, like so there is some contraindication? Do you feel it's safe to be used because now we know from recent data in rheumatoid arthritis that in the past we are hesitant to use methotrexate in people with lung disease and now we know probably it is their lung disease from rheumatoid rather than the medication that was causing the problem and methotrexate is probably appropriate. Do you still use it or more lean toward is a fiber mycophenolate if they have advanced pulmonary sarcoid? So the question advanced pulmonary sarcoid would use methotrexate. It's still my favorite drug and my first choice in pulmonary sarcoid, even fibrotic sarcoid. Um, if I can't use it for liver reasons, uh, then, uh, or, um, uh, then I may use azathioprine unless the patient has thiopurine methyl transferase deficiency. But it remains the drug of choice. If you have a good pulmonologist working with you, you don't have to worry about the toxicity from methotrexate is rare in terms of progressive pulmonary fibrosis. So I have no qualms about using methotrexate. Because kind of I see it kind of practice sometimes to lean more with yeah. azathioprine and avoid methotrexate in sarcoid. We need uh, clinical trials head-to-head uh, -to, -head to answer that question. Mm. So that's a great observation. But for now, my practice, I use methotrexate as the first choice. Yes, another question. Yeah, just a quick question. Yeah. Yes. Uh, do you have any rationale for using methylprednisolone instead of prednisolone? Yes. That's a great question. That's a question that's dear to my heart. Why do I use methylprednisone rather than prednisone? Now, if you look at methylated steroids, we have various types of steroids. And yesterday, there was a lot of discussion about heart block. And I didn't have the chance to comment about how various steroids, some of them cross the placenta, some of them have different penetration to the liver. But it seems methylated steroids may have an impact on T-cells different than other steroids. However, this has not been studied well. We know that if you use corticosteroids for long term, you may develop steroid resistant at, this, at the TNF receptor level. So actually I had this exact discussion with Jerry Krishnan, who's well known in the field of pulmonary. Why everybody who comes with COPD to the emergency room, we load them with steroids. Everybody takes 100 milligram of salimidrol every six hours, and they get better. You send them home, 60 of prednisone, nothing happens. So I believe long-term corticosteroid use may result in resistance similar to NSAIDs, and switching among corticosteroids sometimes may be beneficial. How I'm going to prove that? I'm probably looking for half a million dollar of funding to prove this hypothesis, but I think it is, that's why I use methylprednisone more. And we'll have the last question. Thank you very much, uh, Doctor. Uh, just I have a simple question. Um, as you mentioned, and we know uh, sarcoidosis as multi multi-systemic disorder. Uh, so uh, just I want to know uh, which branch should deal with uh, such disease from the beginning and should uh, follow up uh, the patients. Uh, I mean, some, some patients may present with skin involvement without uh, joint involvement. Uh, should be uh, followed by a dermatologist only or should be referred to our uh, clinic? Or, Great uh, question. Yes. Which physician should follow sarcoidosis? Yes. I'm a, I belong to the very old school of medicine. I mean, Rabbani Dr. Qandil Shakir. I still follow those principles I learned at the University of Jordan. Nobody owns the patient. I believe regardless what disease you have, when you are a patient, you want a compassionate physician to take care of you. The structure in Jordan is different than other places. And even at the place I work at, we have lack of infrastructure. So I believe as long as you have a dedicated physician who can follow the patient and work well with the team, no one person can manage sarcoid. You need a multidisciplinary approach. So if it's mainly pulmonary, no harm of having the pulmonologist follow uh, the patient and refer him to other specialties. But one should take the lead of managing immunosuppressive therapy given the safety. But no one owns the patient. I think we... We all should be serving patients, and it's an honor to take care of patients. Thank you, Professor Nadira. Maybe, Thank you. Uh, we have a uh, lack of time. Uh, if anybody wants to ask more questions, you can uh, 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 in the coffee break or directly with Professor Nadira. Thank you again.